I'm Joan Gilman, and I'm a member of this committee that's bringing you, and I'm not going to trip, on um, today's annual event. I'm already booking Steve for next year. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to get dressed up. <laughs> Retirement does not give me an opportunity to wear one of my favorite jackets. So uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to uh, wear a skirt, which I only do like twice a year these days. Retirement certainly changes your wardrobe, doesn't it? Which is why we're not consuming, because we're all retired. Steve Rick, I don't know how many of you have taken economic courses, but I went back to school at 40. I think I said this last year, but forgive me, because I'm going to do it again. And the first course I took was macroeconomics. And I didn't understand a word they said. I got a B. And I was thrilled because it was way beyond anything that a former art major and radio and TV major understood. And then I took micro and I loved it. And then I met Steve Rick and I understood it. And it was amazing. Steve teaches at the university. He is the chief economist, senior, senior, chief, chief, chief. CUNA Mutual. He travels all over the world giving speeches. Twice a week he gives a talk to somebody somewhere, uh, which is why our airport is so busy, um, and does a fabulous job. So I'm not going to take any more of his time. Would you join me in welcoming Steve Rick and encourage him to come back? Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank the Retirement Association for inviting me back here. I don't know how many years I've been here, over 10, 10 15, long time I've been coming back to speak with you all. So I see a lot of familiar faces. It's always nice. Uh, well, basically, we have a few hours here to talk about the economy. Where is it headed? When's the next recession? That's always the big uh, question I get when I'm traveling around the country giving this speech. Uh, before I do, let me just take a quick survey to get a read on what you guys think about the, this economy. Uh, I'm basically going to give you two options. How many in this audience think the economy is going to be better in the next year or two compared to the past year or two? So you got either better or worse. I want you all to think about it for a second. We'll take a survey, raise your hand about how many think it's going to be better in the next year or two compared to the past year or two, and how many think it's going to be worse? All right, think about it. All right, so the optimists first. Who think the economy is going to be better in the next couple years compared to the last two years? Raise your hand if you think it's going to be better. You got one, two, three, four. How many think it's going to be worse? All right. I just want to get a read of my audience here. Okay. So a lot of you think it's going to be worse. Um, we'll take a look at all the charts and graphs once again. I kind of follow the economist credo that if you can't say it with a chart or a graph, then it's probably not worth saying. So I have a lot of charts and graphs to go through here in the next couple hours. Uh, basically, um, you know, there is a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. You have Brexit over in Europe. You know, Britain's trying to leave the European Union. There could be a no deal. That could slow down Britain's economy or the European Union. So there's a lot of uncertainty with that. You've got China slowing down their growth, worried about a little recession there. You've got Australia and Canada in a housing bubble. Could that pop, causing recessions there? So basically, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. We have a trade war still going on with China. That's leading to uncertainty. Businesses are pulling back a little bit on their spending on capital investment, building new factories, buying new equipment. So the point is, there's a lot going on in the world today. In fact, there's so much going on, I kind of feel like a mosquito at a nudist colony. I don't know where to begin. So, basically, we're going to begin by talking about the most important price in any economy. What's the most important price? Is it the price of oil? The price of gold? The price of the dollar, the exchange rate. What do you think the most important price is? Interest rates. Interest rates are the most important price. The price of money, the price to rent money, right? Borrow money, rent it. Why? Well, the Federal Reserve controls that interest rate to control the overall macro economy. So economists should always start out talking about interest rates and the price of money and where are interest rates headed. What is the Fed going to do? You know, the Fed just met last week. What did the Federal Reserve do with interest rates last week? Did they raise them, lower them, or keep them the same? They kept them the same. All right, we're going to look at the same charts the Federal Reserve looked at last week to make that determination 
I thought, hey, let's keep the interest rates the same right now. All right, so what I want to do is I could do every year is start holding my five-minute Federal Reserve Board meeting. I want you all to play the Federal Reserve Board. Let's say you were all in Washington, D.C. last week, meeting at the Federal Reserve Building there. You've got the seven uh, Board of Governors. You've got the 12 Federal Reserve Bank Presidents. They get all in one room. They look at the economic charts, and they decide. Do we raise rates, lower interest rates, or keep them the same? Well, first of all, we have to ask, what does the Federal Reserve even care about when they're raising or lowering interest rates? Well, the Federal Reserve has what's called a dual mandate. Dual means two, mandate means goal. They got two goals in life at the Federal Reserve. Number one, stable prices. They want inflation low and stable in this country. Can anybody tell me, what is the Federal Reserve's official target for the inflation rate? 2%. 2% is the official target. They want prices, on average, to rise in this country 2%. So think of the price of milk and bread and rents. Have all that go up roughly 2% a year. That, they believe, is perfect. They believe that if prices rise 2% a year, a lot of the other economic variables, like the unemployment rate and economic growth and things like that, all kind of naturally fall into place. So hit 2%. That's what Jerome Powell has embroidered on his pillow when he goes to sleep at night. 2% inflation, number one goal, that's what they care about the most. But they also care about something else, full employment of our resources. What do I mean by resources? Think of labor resources and capital resources. You know, you got a factory, that's the capital part. You got labor, that's the people part. Bring labor and capital together, spread a little technology on top, and boom, you produce goods and services. And that's what economics is a study of, right? Production of goods and services to satisfy our wants and needs as human beings. All right, so we want a full employment of the resources. We don't want people sitting at home not working if they can work. We don't want factories sitting idle if they can produce stuff. All right, so there's the two goals that the Fed has. The Federal Reserve, when they met last week, puts up a little chart like this called critical measures. How do we actually measure the economy? What are we looking for? Well, here's the matrix they actually use. Right in the middle, they have what's called the long-run equilibrium. You know, economists love the word equilibrium. When things are perfectly balanced, supply is equal to demand. In equilibrium, what's our long-run goals? I already gave you one. 2% inflation is that long-run goal, but we have a lot of other goals, too. In economics, we like to use this word natural. There's a natural unemployment rate. There's a natural economic growth rate. Just what the economy tends to naturally do or naturally tends to go to. And that 2% inflation is one of those natural numbers. All right, well, let's actually put up on the chart here some of the things the Fed looks at. Like I said, number one they care about is the inflation rate. There it is, the long run goal, 2%. That's where the economy tends to go to in the long run. Where are we today? We're sitting about 1.8%. Inflation is a little bit low. Prices haven't been rising very strongly lately. Here's the actual chart. Once again, we love charts and graphs. You see the blue line on that chart? There's the inflation rate. If you notice the axis, I got 1%, 2%. You see the goal line across the chart? There's the Fed's target. We want to hit 2%. The reason I use gold, think of Goldilocks. It's not too hot, not too cold. 2% inflation is just right. Notice since the Great Recession here of 08, 09, every time you see a bar like that, those gray bars, those represent recessions. There's your Great Recession. Notice since the Great Recession, we've been running a little bit cool. Inflation is a little bit lower than what it should be. We'll talk about more, in, more of those in a minute. But think about that 2% line. I want to talk about these 2%, these natural numbers in economics. They say economics is a social science, right? I actually teach economics in the social science building at UW. Well, let's, let's think about that phrase, social science. Social means humans, right? Science means we apply math and equations to the study of humans. All right, well, let me ask you one question. What is your normal body temperature? 98.6. Your body cycles around 98.6. Maybe you woke up this morning, your temperature was 97 degrees. Maybe this afternoon after walking around, it'll be 99 degrees. But it cycles around that 98.6. Think of that as your long run equilibrium. Remember my chart right here, my middle edge, your long run goal? That's your 98.6. Basically, if you look back here during this time period, look at the economy was running hot. That's like your body being at 99 degrees. The economy's running hot above this goal line. Think of that goal line as the 98.6 analogy. The economy's running hot, then it runs cool because we're in a recession. That makes sense. People aren't buying, so inventories are piling up, so firms have to cut their prices in order to clear the inventory. So you'd expect prices to be low, but notice they've been low for quite a long time here. 
Can anybody tell me, why has inflation been below this 2% natural number that the economy wants to go to, just like your body wants to go to 98.6? The economy wants to be at 2%. But something in the last few years, since 2013, 2014, 15, 16, 17, keeping inflation low, which means interest rates stay low. Because there's a correlation. When you have low inflation, you have low interest rates. If inflation goes up, interest rates go up. But right now, interest rates are low, partly due to this. But why has inflation been so low? You know, the Federal Reserve is becoming frustrated. They go, we want to hit this 2% target, but it hasn't. Why hasn't it hit it? What's one of the biggest things? One, oil prices have been relatively low. You know, what's the, what's the price, of, price of a gallon of gas right now? 30 to 40 to 50, it's stayed relatively low. So oil's not been a big pressure moving inflation up. But even more important than that, what's happened to the value of the dollar in the last few years? It's been rising. The value of the dollar is up basically in the last five years, is up like 20%. So our exchange rate is rising, the value of the dollar is up. But what does that mean for the price of, say, imports? Say you like buying French wine. If the value of the dollar is up 20%, what does it mean for the bottle of French wine and what's happening to its price? It's dropping 20%, so it's cheaper. So you go into Steve's Liquor there on University Avenue and want to buy that French wine, its price is falling because of the value of the dollar is going up. But just think of the Napa Valley wine, the California winemakers. What do they have to do to their price in order to sell their wine? They've got to lower it in order to compete with the French wine or nobody's going to buy the California wine. And once again, assuming they're perfect substitutes, you don't care which one you buy. Basically, it's keeping inflation low in this country. So a lot of this per blue line being below the Fed's target is because the value of the dollar keeps rising higher and higher and higher. And we'll talk more about why is the value of the dollar rising higher in a minute. A lot of this is due to low oil prices, the strong dollar keeping import prices low. But what's our forecast? I mean, we want to kind of look in the future. We want to look into our crystal ball, say what's going to happen in the economy with this economic variable. We actually expect it to run a little bit hot here in 2019, 2022, moving above this, a little bit above the Fed's inflation target. Why? What's happening with the labor market today? Is the labor market tight or does it have a lot of slack to it? It's very tight. It's very hard to find workers. You go around, talk to employers today. Their biggest concern right now is talent acquisition, finding workers to actually come work for them. You guys have been dri driving around Madison. You see all these help wanted signs at every restaurant, every gas station, every bank. Everybody's trying to find workers. In fact, the biggest thing right now is just finding people who will, one, show up to work on time, two, can pass a drug test, three, can pass a criminal background check. It's really hard to find quality workers today. So, Push, that's going to be pushing up wages. As wages go up, firms will raise the price of the product in order to maintain their profit margins. Because if their labor costs are rising, they've got to raise the price slightly above the 2% here. The main point is inflation is not going to get out of control. It's not going to be rising to 4 5 6%. It'll rise slightly above the Fed's target before, we believe, maybe dropping here in the out year. Maybe in a year or so, it'll come back below that. Why? we may have a slight slowdown, a slight economic recession. In fact, you're going to call it a growth recession. Not a full-blown recession where output is slowing or going negative. This is just the economic growth rate slowing down just a little bit. And we'll see that more in a minute. But expect a little bit higher inflation, then a little bit lower, but kind of hugging around that 2% line. Main point is, it's not going to be pushing interest rates really high or really low. All right, let's move on to the next thing the Fed cares about. The unemployment rate, uh, basically 5% is another one of these natural numbers where the economy tends to go to. Kind of think of the word gravitate, gravity. We want to be pulled towards that 5% number. Where are we today? 3.5%. Uh, Actually, the unemployment rate just came out about a week or so ago. The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out and said we are at 3.5% unemployment rate. Notice there's a big gap to where we should be in the long run when everything's in equilibrium compared to where we are today. Let's take a look at the chart. Here it is. Let me put on this goal line. See that goal line across the chart? There's where the economy wants to be at. That's the 98.6 degrees. You can see sometimes we're below that very tight labor market. Wages are rising, can't find workers. You go into a recession there, the unemployment rate goes above the long run natural rate where we want to be because of the recession. But then it falls below. Notice how it's just kind of cycling around that gold line. Just like your body, 96 degrees this morning, 99 this afternoon. Cycles. Here's your great recession, 10% unemployment rate. 
That's like your body catching a really bad flu or something. You're not feeling re really well. You're way away from its long run average where it should be. But once again, the economy heals itself, comes right back down to that long run gold line. And then you can see where we're at today. Look at that huge gap. This, you know, economists measure how tight the labor market is by where we should be and where we actually are. That is a tight labor market, which is pushing up wages. And like I said, a lot of these people who are, you know, this unemployed uh, section here, about 3.5% of our labor force, it translates to roughly 6 million people. Now, when we hired, did anybody see how many jobs did we hire in the last month? The job creation that came out in the last month. Did anybody see that number? It's like over 260,000, about 266,000 people got hired. Where are we hiring those people from? coming from this pool of unemployed workers? The answer is no. We're actually not hiring the six million unemployed because basically their, their, their skill level is extremely low. They can barely read and write. They have really poor skill level. What we're doing is we're bringing people from outside the labor force, people who may be retired like yourself or people who are just sitting at home taking care of children, and they're coming into the labor force. That's who's actually filling or creating these 260,000 new jobs. So we're not actually really pulling down the unemployment rate any further. We're just bringing new people in who are out, outside of the labor force. All right, so very tight, wages are going up, but you see we cycle right around that gold line. All right, moving on, what's our forecast? You see this green I've just added in? If we do have a slight recession, a growth recession, say coming up here in 2020, 2021, notice the unemployment rate will rise slightly, slightly above that gold line where we want to be, and then it'll slowly come back down. By the year 2023, it'll be back roughly to the, where we should be. Once again, we'll cycle around that, so we'll just catch a minor cold, if you will, a minor flu with the unemployment rate rising above. But nothing like we saw here with the Great Recession when we hit 10%. So expect maybe a slight uptick in the unemployment rate. Moving on, what do we expect for the economic growth of the United States? Will we continue to produce more goods and services? And let me ask you, can anybody tell me, what is the natural, organic growth rate for the U.S. economy? How much more stuff do we just naturally make each year? 2%. We make 2% more goods and services each year just naturally, just organically. Now, how does that happen? How do we just produce 2% more, say, uh, bushels of wheat, 2% more airplanes, 2% more pens, whatever? We produce 2% more stuff each year naturally. How does that happen? Let's put it this way. You bring in 1% more people into a factory due to population growth. If you got 1% more people in your society, 1% more people in the offices and factories, you should be able to produce 1% more stuff. The second way, think of the existing workers in that factory. To bring in new workers, look at the existing workers. The existing, existing workers typically get about 1% more productive each year. They get better computers, they're smarter, they can do their jobs better. The output typically goes up 1% a year. So economists do the sophisticated math. We had 1% labor force growth to 1% productivity growth. At 1 plus 1, you get 2. You see the goal line across my chart? There it is. The economy naturally grows 2% a year due to more people and smarter people. I always kind of think of the quantity and quality. And we've all heard that, right? There's a quantity and the quality aspect. Quantity, we got more people, but quality, we got better, smarter people with better computers and better tools to work with. Notice how we cycle right around that 2%, 2, 2, 1, 5, 2, 4, 1, 6, 3, just cycle right around 2%. Remember your body cycling around 98.6. All right, you've heard in the news, this is the longest economic expansion in American history. We got data going back to 1854, tracking GDP. This is the longest period we've had between recessions. There's a recession, the red bar, there's a recession, 2001, the 2008, 2009 Great Recession, where the economy is actually receding, producing less goods and services. When you had the whole, remember the whole banking crisis, it's been, what, uh, 10, 11 years now, but remember Lehman Brothers failing, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the two big mortgage giants, they failed. AIG, the biggest insurance company in the world, they failed. We're basically bailing out the banks with TARP, $800 billion for that. Basically, that was over, and we've had a nice expansion now for the last 10 years. In fact, we've gone 10 and a half years now, no recession, the longest ever. What do we expect for the future? 
Oh, here it is. Basically, we expect this year, 2019, we're going to grow about 2.3%. So we're going to make 2.3% more stuff in this economy this year than we did last year. 2% more goods and services. But notice in 2020, I'm forecasting a little bit of a red bar there. 1% growth. Now you, can, now you should say, Steve, how can you call that a recession if we're still growing? We're still producing 1% more stuff. Economists will define that if we're not at that 2%, if we're far enough away, if there's a far enough gap here, we actually classify that as a growth recession. We had that similar back here in 2001. In 2001, we actually grew a 1%, but it's so far below the normal growth rate, we actually classify that as a growth recession. Basically, you're not, hiring, you're not producing enough stuff, you're not expanding operations fast enough to absorb all the new workers coming in, which pushes up the unemployment rate. So we expect a little bit of a slowdown next year. We'll talk about the reasons why. And then 1.5% the year after that. Remember, we want to go to that 2% line. But every once in a while, you get sick. The, the economy, which is like the body here, doesn't feel quite well and drops. But then by year 2023, we get a little boom back, a little pent-up demand. People haven't bought cars and appliances for a while. By 2023, we'll be roaring back to 3% again. Notice the general shape here. We've kind of got a U-shaped pattern, right? Last year we grew 3%, dropping down to one before it comes back to th a three. So remember that U-shaped pattern. We'll see it a couple more times this morning. A little bit of a U-shape. Uh, let me ask you, why was last year such a pretty strong year? Actually, last year, 2018, we grew 3%, was the strongest year of this economic expansion of 10 years. Why was last year so good? We had tax cuts. Big tax cuts, put about one and a half to 3% more disposable income into year in my pocket. We'd go out and spend that. That was one, what was the other factor? Government spending went up. Spent a lot more in the military, so we bought a lot more planes, tanks, bullets, all that stuff. Big increase in government spending, 3% in the tax cuts, but that will start to fade here in 2020. All right, so basically, why would we have this growth recession? Well, let me just define to you what a recession is. Recessions occur when there's too little spending to keep the economy resources from falling idle, from having a factory sit idle or an office sit idle. Not enough spending to keep the factory producing its level of output. All right, well, basically, I've got six factors here pointing to what I call that growth recession. We're still growing, but not growing fast enough to keep absorbing all the workers from the, from the labor force. All right, so what do we have here? Well, the credit cycle drives the business cycle. We'll see at the very end, my last chart, basically if you take away anything from this seminar this morning, what drives the U.S. business cycle is the U.S. credit cycle. Making loans and not making loans at banks. Making loans and then not making loans. Number two here, the recent fiscal stimulus, tax cuts increase in government spending, basically will fade in 2020. That will be a drag on the economy. It'll help slow it down. Plus, what's happening, what happens every 10 years in this country from the government's perspective? The, dece the, the decennial census, where they count us all. Well, right now, they're hiring a lot of people, but by the end of next year, end of 2020, they're going to lay off about 300,000 of these census workers, which will help drag the economy down to a slow recession or a growth problem. Uh, number three, a stronger dollar will decrease export growth. The value of the dollar just keeps rising and rising and rising. If you're a farmer in Wisconsin, do you like seeing the dollar go up and up and up? No. A stronger dollar makes the price of, say, Wisconsin cheese, when we want to sell it to Canada or anywhere else around the world, it pushes up the price to foreign buyers. So if I'm up in Canada and I see the value of the dollar going up, which means the price of Wisconsin cheese is going up, maybe I'll substitute to some other country. I'll go buy French cheese if Americans' exchange rate keeps rising. So it will hurt our exports. Anything we manufacture or farm products will be hurt as the dollar goes up because they become less price competitive on the world market. Uh, number four here, we still have the trade wars and tariffs are reducing world trade, which historically is a precursor to a recession. Every time we have a recession, we see a slowdown in world trade. And as we keep hearing the news, the tariffs and trade war is slowing down world trade, not just between us and China, but Europe is also seeing a big drop in their trade with the rest of the world also. And then the last one, recessions typically begin two and a half years after the economy begins to overheat. We're going to see in a minute a chart showing that the U.S. economy is overheating. And history shows 
you overheat for about two and a half years, and then you go into recession. We have these natural cycles that take place in economics. We overheat, and then we cool down. We overheat and cool down. So that's a, a number five there. I guess I only have five, not six. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, one of my favorite charts I like to show my macroeconomic students at UW. In fact, we just took our final exam yesterday for my Econ 102 Principles of Macroeconomics. The chart we spend most time on analyzing in class is something called the Economic Output Gap Chart. Once again, output, that's just the output of goods and services, everything we make. But there could be a little bit of a gap in what we're making versus what we should be making and how much the level of output. Uh, the Federal Reserve, their magic number here, their natural number, they want zero gap. You know, just like a carpenter doesn't want a gap in his woodwork, the Fed doesn't want a gap in the economy. They don't want the economy to operating at its normal level of production. They don't want it overheating or being a slack with excess capacity sitting around, assembly line sitting idle. Where are we at today? Actually a 2% positive gap. We are not at the number the Fed wants us to be at. They want to be at zero, we're sitting at 2%. All right, let's take a look at this chart. I said, why is this my favorite chart? Because it shows the US business cycle. The expansions and recessions. Expansions and recessions. Well, here it is, going all the way back to 1995. Expansion, recession, expansion. Big recession, where we're at today. Back to an expansion, back to overheating. All right, this is a nice chart. You can see the purple bars represent recessions. You know, the 2001 recession right there, the 2008, 2009 recession. But you know, this is macroeconomics. Does anybody know what, what is the total value of the goods and services we make in this country? You know, here we're the biggest economy in the world. China's catching up, but we're still the biggest. We still produce more goods and services than anybody else in the world. What is the total dollar value of all that we make? How big are we? Closing in on $22 trillion worth of goods and services. Trillions, $22 trillion is what we make. All right, but that's a lot to kind of wrap your brain around. And this chart kind of shows the level of output uh, that we're making, expansion, expansion, recession. But that's macro. It's hard to wrap your brain around. Let's go to microeconomics, study of one individual firm. Now, we're all here in Wisconsin. What is Wisconsin known for making? Cheese. No matter where I go in this country, get the same speech, everybody yells out cheese for Wisconsin. I don't want to talk about cheese. What's the second thing we're known for making? Beer. beer. beer we're literally number two. Always they yell out beer number two. I don't want to talk about beer. What's the third thing we're known for making? Harley Davidson motorcycles. Remember Milwaukee, they got that big factory there producing Harley Davidson's, because I want you all to visualize the Harley Davidson factory, because it's kind of easy to see its production, there's motorcycles rolling off an assembly line, everybody visual, assembly line, kind of that old, you know, Henry Ford, the Model T rolling off assembly line. Well, think of a Harley Davidson going down the assembly line where people's putting on the tires, the handlebars, the gas tank, the headlight, it's rolling down the assembly line. Let's say when they built Harley Davidson factory in Milwaukee. The engineers, the architects got together and said, let's make a factory that can produce 100 motorcycles per day. So 100 motorcycles flow, and I want to emphasize that word flow, flow out of this factory every day. Because really, when you think about GDP, gross domestic product, that's a flow concept. It's our production per year. It's our income per year for the US. Remember I said that $22 trillion that's 22 trillion per year. It's a flow concept in economics and accounting. How much we've been saying the same thing with that, that factory. We're producing 100 motorcycles per day. It's a flow concept. All right, so I want this chart, instead of representing the 22 trillion economy, I just wanted to represent Harley Davidson and their production. So Harley Davidson is going to represent the entire US economy. Let's go back to say 1995. In 1995, let's say you called up the manager at Harley and say, hey, how's business? How's your production? You guys cranking out 100 motorcycles like you're supposed to be? The factory's designed that, all your assembly lines are ready to go for 100 motorcycles. And they say, no, no, not really. We got a minus 2% output gap. How many motorcycles were they making? 98. They're only making 98. So maybe they laid off a few workers or maybe put a few workers on furlough or maybe took Johnny from full-time status to 
part-time status. So instead of being 40 hours a week, he's only 20 hours a week. His income's dropping. All right, that took place here in 95, 96. A little bit of a weak economy. By the year 2000, you called up Harley and say, hey, how's business? How's production? You making those 100 motorcycles like this factory was designed, what we call in economics, your potential output? 100 is potential. They go, oh, no, no, we're above that. We got a 3% positive gap right now. How many motorcycles are they making? Three. 103 motorcycles at a factory designed to produce 100. You should stop me right there, right there and say, wait a minute, how can that happen? How can you produce 103 motorcycles at a factory designed to produce 100 per day? The flow per day. Hardly have to do to crank out 103 motorcycles. Overtime. Right? Just pay overtime. Put on a second shift, put on nighttime shift, but you're paying overtime. What's hap what do you pay people that are, pay or are working overtime? Time and a half. Wages are rising very quick at Harley and throughout the entire economy. What does Harley have to do to the price of the motorcycle to maintain their profit margin? Raise the price of their motorcycle to keep profits constant. So during periods like this, we call this an overheating economy. Inflation is rising. Remember, let's take this back to the Fed. The Fed hates inflation. Probably during this time, inflation was rising 4%, 5%. Remember, what's the Fed's target? Two, so if you're Jerome Powell, you seeing the economy overheating here, prices rising, what do you do with interest rates? You raise interest rates. So banks raise the rates, their interest rates on their, more, on their motorcycle loans and car loans. People stop buying motorcycles and cars. And right here, we see production start to drop back down. Remember, we want to be at zero. Zero is where we want to be. Right there is perfect. Right there, zero is perfect. But sometimes you raise rates too much, and we go into a recession. Now, that's theory. That's economic theory. That's the stuff I teach in my textbooks to the students at UW. But does the Fed actually do that? Does the Fed actually raise interest rates when the economy is overheating like this? You're cranking out 103 motorcycles. Prices are rising. Inflation is getting out of control. The answer is yes. See the blue line I just added? The blue line is the Federal Reserve controlling the Fed funds interest rate. That's the interest rate the Federal Reserve controls. That's what we just talked about last week where the Fed didn't change that interest rate. They kept it the same. But they do raise it when the economy is overheating to slow things down. They're trying to stabilize the business cycle. Like I said, here is the U.S. business cycle. They're trying to dampen it. They don't like those big mountains. They don't like big valleys. They try to squeeze those together by using interest rates to control the economy. If we go into a recession like we did here in 2001, the economy's got about 3%, minus 3% up again, the Fed lowers interest rates. Lower interest rates, people borrow more money. They buy more motorcycles. They get production back up again. So I said the most important price in any economy was what? The price of money, which is just interest rates. So that blue line is the most important price in any economy. Notice the Great Recession set in 08, 09. The Fed pushed interest rates down to zero, as measured on this axis. You can see zero up to seven. Interest rates are basically zero for seven years. The Fed just kind of pushed their foot on that monetary accelerator. Put interest rates to zero, so banks lower the interest rates on, say, motorcycle loans. To get people buying more motorcycles. But look at that huge hole. Why do we call it the Great Recession? Because that was a massive hole. Minus 6% output gap. Harley's producing only... 94 motorcycles. It took them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and a half years to get back to producing right there, zero output gap, where we want to be, back to 100 motorcycles. But in the last, look at, in the last, what, since summer of 2017, all of 2018, going through 2019, we're back to 2% positive gap. How many, how, how many motorcycles are they making today? 2% positive gap? And two. Meaning their factory is working above its normal level. Meaning they have to work overtime. Overtime hours are increasing, which means wage costs are going up, which means firms will be raising prices. Remember my earlier chart on inflation? I said we may see inflation rise above the Fed's target it's because of what we're seeing right here. Notice this is an overheating economy. The economy today is operating above its normal production level. We 
over time, factories running full speed ahead, not shutting them down to do proper maintenance and oiling and changing parts, that type of deal. You can't keep running an economy at 102%. It has to come back down. There's this natural cycle. So notice the Fed, Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed Reserve, had been raising interest rates nine times over the last three years. Remember, they keep raising interest rates by a quarter point. So One-fourth of a percentage point, a quarter, a quarter. They did that nine times, because they saw this coming. They saw the out negative output gap going away. Now we got a positive output gap. They don't want that either. They want rate to be right at zero. So they raised it nine times. They got up to what? What did, they, what did the interest rates get up to roughly this summer, like in June, July? Here's 2.5. They basically got right next to 2.5 which economists believe is the natural interest rate for that Fed funds rate. Remember, we got all these natural numbers, 5% unemployment, 2% inflation. Two and a half is what we kind of say is the natural or what that interest rate should be in the long run, two and a half percent. So the Fed got really close to that, but then they pivoted. So we call this the Powell pivot after Jerome Powell. He started to lower interest rates again. You always hear the Fed saying, we set interest rates based on the data, based on economic data. We don't listen to politicians. We don't listen to Trump when he's you know, tweeting about us, saying we're all idiots, don't know what we're doing. We look at the data. But notice the data says we got a 2% positive gap, meaning inflation should be coming up. So what should the Fed, according to the data, what should the Fed be doing with interest rates? Should they be raising interest rates? If we're operating up here in an overheating economy, the Fed should probably still have raised interest rates, but now they're lowering them. Why are they lowering interest rates if the economy is operating 2% above normal? Harley's cranking them out, they're trying to find workers, can't find workers, working overtime, working on second shifts, night shifts, cranking up motorcycles as fast as we can. But they're lowering interest rates, which only increase the demand for more motorcycles, because that means the banks lower interest rates. Why would they lower interest rates today? Why are they lowering? You know, I work for CUNA Mutual Group. We're an insurance company. So when I see something like this, I know an insurance policy when I see one. They're basically taking out an insurance policy. They're worried about all of the uncertainties building up in the world, from Brexit over in Europe, to basically Europe slowing down their economy, to the trade war taking place here, to China slowing down. All of these uncertainties are in place. So the Fed's basically saying, you know what? Let's lower interest rates today build up a little bit of momentum in this U.S. economy so we can ride through any economic storm that may come with, let's say, a bad Brexit or a slowdown in China or Australia and Canada home prices crashing down and those two economies go into recession. So the Fed's saying, let's stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates. Well, what part of the economy gets stimulated the most when you lower interest rates? We call them the interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. Which sector of the economy is the most interest rate sensitive? Housing. Yeah, housing, of course, when you buy a house, you may be buying a 200, 300, 400, 600,000 dollar house. You typically borrow money when you do that, so it's very interest rate sensitive. So we're seeing mortgage rates fall like 1% in the last year. Lower interest rates has stimulated the housing market. We're actually producing 20,000 more new homes this last October than their October a year earlier. So it is stimulating the economic sense, and especially in the housing sector. So the Fed's lowering interest rates, and you can see we're almost down to 1.5 now. So we're close to 2.5, we're down about 1.5. So we are back, you know, this summer, we basically kind of hit neutral. You know, at 2.5%, we actually call it the neutral interest rate, meaning the Fed's not trying to stimulate the economy with low rates, or they're not trying to restrict the economy with high rates. 2.5 is kind of like the Fed's hands off. That's where we should be in the long run. But we are back now to 1.5, which means we're back to stimulative. The Fed says, nope, we got to step on the monetary accelerator to get this car moving faster. Let me change my metaphors here. Basically, they want to move the car along a little bit faster by stepping on the accelerator. All right, so the Fed's dropping this. Um, let me skip over this, we'll, we'll come back to this. I want to talk about that Fed funds rate. So here it is, my long run goal, there it is, 2.5. I said 2.5 is neutral in the long run, that's where we should be. We're sitting at about 1.6 today, so economists look at where we're at versus where we should be and say, yep, 
Lower interest rates than where they should be in the long run means we're back to stimulative monetary policy. The Fed's worried about the future. They're trying to accelerate the economy to blast through any storm that may be coming in 2020 or 2021. All right, and that's where we see right there from 2.5 back down to 1.5 here. And then the last thing the Fed cares about is the 10-year Treasury rate. Now, forget about the Federal Reserve for a second. The Federal Reserve controls short-term interest rates, that Fed funds rate. If you go to Washington, D.C., you see the Federal Reserve building where Jerome Powell works, beautiful marble building. But let's go down the street to the Treasury Department. Treasury, collecting taxes, doing the spending. Who's the Secretary of the Treasury today? Steve Mnuchin. Former Goldman Sachs guy, big executive producer of Hollywood movies, really rich. He's in charge of our Treasury Department. What's our deficit this year? About over a trillion dollars. And just going into this new fiscal year that just started about a month ago, it's getting even worse. We're going to be way over a trillion dollars this year. Anyways, Steve Mnuchin has to sell a lot of bonds. To basically, it's like this. We spend about $4 trillion in the economy. We only tax about $3 trillion. So we have a $1 trillion hole we have to fill by selling bonds to banks, insurance companies, like right across the street, Kinu Mutual Group, pension funds that you guys invest in. They have to sell a trillion dollars worth of bonds to fill this hole. All right, what's the interest rates today on these, say, a 10-year treasury bond? You want to invest money for 10 years, buying a treasury bond. Today, the interest rate's 1.8%. What should it be in the long run, this natural number, where interest rates want to go to, where they want to gravitate to, if you think about gravity in the universe and all that, natural things? We should be at 4%. So notice, interest rates, even in the long term, are way below where they should be. But how did I get that 4% number? You should say, Steve, how did you get 4%? Remember how I calculate the 2% growth rate of the economy? 1% labor force, 1% productivity, I've got two. There's a little rules that economists use to get this also, what long-term interest rates should be. Basically works like this. What's our current inflation rate in this country, roughly? It's kind of bouncing around 2%, right? Easy number. What's our economic growth rate right now? How much stuff are we producing? In the last two quarters, what was the GDP growth rate? So about 2%. We're producing 2% more goods and services in the last couple of quarters. So that's what economists do. We take the 2% economic growth, we're making 2% more goods and services, add it to the prices of that stuff we're making is going up 2% a year. So 2% inflation plus 2% economic growth, that's where we get the 4% number here. But right now we're at 1.8. Well, let's take a look at a chart. Remember I said the price of money is the most important price in the economy? Well, this chart has two interest rates on it, so this must be the most important chart we'll look at today. The black line is the Federal Reserve. There's Jerome Powell. Remember, he raised the block nine times. He's now reversing it, the, Jerome, the Powell pivot. He's lowering interest rates. All right, we've talked about that. Let's talk about the red line. The red line is the 10-year Treasury. So buying a 10-year bond from the government What's the interest rate we can earn on it? Well, you can see where we're at today. It's right around 1.8%, as I mentioned. Notice the drop in the last year. We were over 3%, basically, when we kind of met about a year ago or so. Basically, in 2018, it has dropped significantly. We want to talk about that in a minute. Notice a huge drop in long-term interest rates. The 10-year Treasury has just plummeted, which does what to mortgage interest rates? When the 10-year Treasury falls, what happens to that 30-year mortgage rate that you would use to go on and buy a new house? That is also plummeted. Basically, it works like this. The 30-year mortgage rate is equal to whatever the 10-year is, and add 1.7 to it. So it's an easy number. So let's say right around here is about 3%. So if the 10-year Treasury was 3%, what is the mortgage rate? What's 3 plus 1.7? 4.7. So every time I open up the Wall Street Journal and I quickly see, oh, the 10-year Treasury interest rate, eh, it's 3%, I can quickly say the mortgage rate is what? 4.7%. Just add 1.7. So same thing today. We're about 1.8 today, close to 2%. Add 1.7 to that. What do you get for the mortgage rate? What's 2 plus 1.7? 3.7. So you call up, say, Summit or UW Credit Union and say, hey, what are your mortgage rates? They'll tell you, yeah, about 3.7. 
That's how it works. So because the 10-year treasury has plummeted, the 30-year mortgage rate has plummeted, which has spurred on the housing sector of this economy. All right. What was the big news story this summer about these two interest rates? That was a predictor of a recession. Everybody was talking about it. Every time you turned on CNBC in the morning, you had some economist, some market person, some finance person saying something's going on with interest rates, which is very scary, which always predicts recessions. What was the phrase they used? Inverted yield curve. Inverted yield curve. You heard it over and over and over. Well, what's an inverted yield curve? Well, let me show you one. See, the black is above the red. Whenever the black's above the red, you got short-term rates, the black line, higher than long-term rates, the red line. That's not supposed to happen. That's kind of breaking economic laws, economic rules. You shouldn't have the black above the red. It'd be like your local bank paying you more on a one-year CD than a five-year CD. Now, you take out a five-year CD, you should get paid more than a one-year CD. So it's like a topsy-turvy world. Things aren't, aren't working right. So we call it an inverted, I mean, things are kind of flipped over when you have the black above the red. What's the history on this? Every time the black goes above the red, nine months later, you have a recession. So there it is. Black's above the red. You see that little bar there, that little uh, kind of greenish bar? Boom, you get a recession. Interest rates normalize, the Fed drops interest rates, the 10-year treasury comes down, but they kind of open up that gap again. The black is below the red. That's the way it's supposed to be. But then we get another inversion here. Back in 06, 07, the black goes above the red, flashing red light for economists. Whenever that happens, boom, nine months later you get a recession. So there it is, the recession popped up in 08, 09. The Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, kind of returns interest rates back to normal. So think of this as the normalization of rates. The red's above the blacks. So that's the way it's supposed to be. But then this summer, we had another inversion. The black went above the red. All the economists are screaming, we're going to have a recession. We're going to have a recession. Because it always happens every time. But the question is, why did we have the inversion? Normally, it's because the Federal Reserve is too aggressive and raises short-term rates, which means banks raise the rates on their motorcycle loans and car loans and credit card loans, which chokes off spending. So here is because the Fed was raising rates too high, raising rates too high. Could we really make that argument this time that the Fed raised rates too high? They raise it into restrictive territory. Remember I said, what was the magic number for the Fed funds rate to be neutral? 2.5. So the Fed just kind of raised interest rates to 2.5 right there being neutral. They didn't push it into restrictive territory where rates are too high that people don't buy Harley motorcycles or cars from Ford or GM. What caused the inversion then? The red dropped. The red came down too far. That's what really caused the inversion. Not that the Fed tightened rates too much. It's because long-term rates came down. All right, we gotta try to answer them. What was the causality here? What caused 10-year treasury bond rates to plummet in the last year? That's the biggest news story in the land of economics. Well, basically a couple things. One, negative interest rates in Europe. We have five countries now in Europe with negative interest rates. Meaning, right now, if you bought a 10-year German bond, what's the interest rate you're going to earn on a 10-year German bond today? Minus 0.5. You earn a negative interest rate, meaning if you're going to lend money to the government, you have to pay them to basically lend money to the government. They're not paying you. In Germany, all of their interest rates on their bonds, from one-year bonds out to 30-year bonds, are all negative. We still have positive interest rates in this country, but they have negative in Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden. There's five countries in Europe that have negative rates. There's actually banks in Denmark now offering negative interest rate mortgages. You borrow $100,000 and you pay back $99,000. It's a negative interest rate mortgage. All right, five countries in Europe have negative rates. What other country, there's one more country around the world that has negative rates, which is that's not in Europe. Japan. There are six countries in the world with negative rates. So we have negative rates in Europe, 
But why would that push our interest rates down? Just because they're negative, why does that mean our interest rates have to go lower? Yeah. I always like to use the example of Hans. There's this guy named Hans. He lives in Germany. Let's say he's really rich. He's got 600 million euros. If you're Hans, do you want to buy a 10-year German bond that you've got to pay them money to lend them? Will they pay you a negative interest rate? No. You want to at least get a positive return. You want to earn a positive interest rate. What do you do with your money then? He brings it over here to the United States. What does he do with the 600 million euros? He's got to exchange them for dollars if he wants to buy an American bond. So he goes in the foreign exchange market and say in New York City, calls up Bank of America and say, I got 600 million years. Can I switch my deposits for dollar deposits? They say, sure. But so if he's buying all these dollars and selling all his euros, what does that do to the value of the dollar? It appreciates the dollar and depreciates the euro. Remember, they move opposite each other. So the dollar is going up because he wants to buy all the dollars and he wants to sell all his euros, so he's pushing his own currency down. The dollar appreciates, remember I said, 20% over the last five years, which means a bottle of French wine that we talked about earlier is dropping 20% in price. It's because a Hans moving money through the capital markets in Wall Street, in New York City, which is pushing up our currency, but pushing down you know, inflation in this country. All right, so he's got all these dollars now. He brings them to the bond market. He calls up Steve Mnuchin and says, hey, I'm ready to go. I've got all my dollars. I want to buy your bonds. So he takes all these dollars and he floods the bond market with it. If you increase his supply of something, like increase the supply of money as Hans brings all his money, what does that do to the price of something if you increase the supply of it? You increase the supply of oil in the world, what happens to the price of oil? It goes down. You increase the supply of dollars, and the bond market from Hans, he pushes down the price of money, which is right here. So we call this the Hans effect. He's dumping all his money here because of the negative interest rates in Europe. So basically the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Germany, has pushed interest rates so low, it is impacting our interest rates here. So what happens in Europe doesn't stay in Europe. Number two, expectations of lower inflation. Right now, we'll be looking at a chart in a minute. But basically, we, you know, this is a 10-year bond, right? So if you're going to invest your money for 10 years, you kind of want to get a best guess of what inflation will be over those next 10 years. Because you don't want your purchasing power of your money to be eroded away with super high inflation, right? So when you're buying a bond, you kind of say, what is inflation going to be in the next 10 years if I buy a 10-year investment? Well, right now, the bond market is expecting lower inflation over the next 10 years. This is called the Japanification of the world. But what, what, what's inflation been in, in Japan for the last 30 years? Either zero or actually deflation. They've gone through many years of actually prices falling. They believe that could actually be occurring throughout the rest of the world, that we could be seeing lower and lower inflation. All right, well, if you lower inflation, remember I said, what does that do to interest rates? It brings interest rates down. One of the reasons this is falling is to say, you know what? We could be turning Japanese. We could be the Japanification of the world. Maybe we're going to have lower inflation, which brings down interest rates. That's number two. Number three here is fears of secular stagnation. Does, it, does everybody remember who coined this term, secular stagnation? It's an economist from Harvard. Does that ring a bell? Lawrence Summers. He used to be former Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, kind of an intellectual giant in the world of economics at Harvard. He's actually president of Harvard for a while. Basically, he has coined this term that the whole world is kind of going into secular stagnation. That, I was talking about inflation slowing down, but what about the production of goods and services? What did I say is our natural organic growth rate of the economy? 2%, right? We just naturally produce 2% more stuff because of 1% labor force growth, 1% productivity growth. But what if those two numbers are slowing? What if we're not going to have 1% labor force growth anymore? And that starts to slow to 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Actually, to be honest with you, we're actually at about 0.6 right now, labor force growth. It's slowing rapidly. What about productivity growth, this other variable over here? That's also been slowing. So we could see a secular stagnation in the whole world, not just here in the United States, but basically everywhere. Things are just kind of slowing down. So let's say in a few years from now, if I'm still giving this speech to you, what if I say the natural growth rate is no longer 2% anymore? Now it's only 1%. That the economy just produces 1% more stuff. 
due to population growth and income growth and productivity growth. Well, think of yourself as Harley Davidson again. If the economy is only growing 1% a year, how big does your factory have to grow every year? Just barely 1% slow. When I first started studying economics back in 1981, my first year of college, back then the growth rate of the U.S. economy was 3.5%. We grew 3.5% naturally every year. And then it went down to three, and then it went down to two and a half. Today on my chart, we're down to two, but in a few years, I'm gonna have to adjust it down to one and a half, and then one. So if the economy's not growing very fast, think of Harley doesn't have to expand their factory very fast, which means they don't have to go to the bank to borrow money to expand the factory. So a lot of commercial lending is slowing down. Right? If you don't have to borrow money to build new factories because the economy is not growing fast, commercial lending starts slowing. But everybody's still saving. Hans over in Europe is saving. I see a lot of people in this room, you know, they saved a lot of money, the graying of the world population. So savings is growing faster than borrowing because the economy is stagnant. Why borrow money to build a new factory? So you got less demand for borrowing, but an increase in savings because of the graying of the world's population. If you increase the supply of something and decrease its demand, what happens to its price? It gets lower. The price of money is dropping. Interest rates are dropping because we have a glut of savings in the world. Everybody wants to save because they're getting older, but we're not seeing much demand for investment. Pushing down interest rates, or what we call secular stagnation. The last one here, just expectations. You know, in economics, we're just dealing with humans, right? So we got to get into their brain, their psychology, their belief system. What is their expectation of interest rates in the future? Notice, I'm talking about expectations of low future short-term interest rates. So think of the next 10 years. Remember, I'm dealing with the 10-year treasury bond here. So you can either buy, no, think of investment opportunities. I can either go out today, say if I have an investment horizon of 10 years. You know, maybe I have a, a kid ready to go to college in 10 years, so I want to buy an investment today. I can buy one 10-year treasury bond, right? And then in 10 years, it matures. That's one investment uh, opportunity. What's the opposite of doing buying one 10-year bond if I have a 10-year investment horizon? I could buy 10 one-year bonds, right? I just buy a one-year bond and it matures. Like, it's kind of like buying a 10 one-year CDs do that versus buying a 10-year CD. Hopefully in the long run, those two should kind of give you the same rate of return in 10 years. Well, that's the idea here. Expectations of low future short-term rates. Do I have a short-term rate on this chart? Which line is short-term? The black line. So my short-term interest rate is the black line. Basically the bond market has expectations right now that the Fed in the future will push this black line low and keep it low. So it kind of works like this. This is in, in my banking class that I teach at UW. This is called the expectations theory. The expectations theory of interest rates states that long-term interest rates today, that red line right there, that 1.8%, it's just the average where I expect this black line to be in the next 10 years. If I expect this black dot to be roughly about the same for the next 10 years, that's what today's 10-year treasury is. But today's 10-year treasury is just the average of what I think short-term rates would be. Remember that buying 10 one-year treasury bonds? Basically, the market thinks the Fed's gonna keep this one year kind of right around 1.5, 1.6 for the next 10 years which means the 10-year ad adapts to that, basically is around 1.8 today. So basically, if we expect short-term rates will be low, that pulls down the long-term rate today. So these four factors have brought interest rates down, brought mortgage rates down, helped stimulate the economy. But if you're a saver, this is hurting the savers in this country, like a lot of people in this room with our bond yields, just drop dramatically because of these four factors right now impacting our economy. So economists are studying this, trying to see, are they going to stay there? Are we going to keep interest rates low for the next 10 years? Will we ever go back up to 3% anytime soon? You know, we're at 1.8. Will it get back up to 3? A lot of the literature we're seeing out of Wall Street, they're saying, you know what? It could take maybe three, four years if we ever get back to that 3%. It may be quite a while. We could be in this low interest rate environment for many years. 
Moving on, so let me ask you another survey question here. What is the probability the United States will experience negative interest rates over the next five years? I said there's five countries in Europe right now with negative interest rates. Japan has had negative interest rates for years. So I'll give you four different options. And I want you all to pick one. We're gonna do our own little survey vote here. A is 5% that, no, the United States is different. It's a small chance that we'll have negative interest rates in this country. Uh, B, one out of four chance, 25%. C, 50-50, hey, we could or maybe not. Or D, 95%, but the high probability we're gonna have negative interest rates. We're following Germany and Japan and all these other European countries. All right, I want you all to pick one. A, B, C, or D. We'll go through here, take a vote. How many thinks A, how many thinks B? Give you a couple seconds here. What is the probability the US will experience negative interest rates over the next five years? Based on the little analysis we just went through, those four reasons why our interest rates are dropping. They're not at zero yet. Let me just take you back. Here, we're still at 1.8. Like I said, in Germany, their dots right here. We're up there, we're, Germany's there. Same thing with Denmark and France and Switzerland. All right, let's do the A's. How many think now nah, the United States is different? We're not gonna have negative interest rates. Say A, raise your hand, 5%. Okay, how many think B, 25%. C, 50-50 shot. Uh, D, 95, couple. Um, I, was, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago. They had a former Federal Reserve uh, governor and he was basically saying, he thought it was around the 95%. You know, just one man's opinion, you know, I won't name who it was, but he said, you know, he thought we were gonna follow the rest of the world, that this trend would just continue down and that the Fed would have to lower interest rates. And if we go into the growth recession next year, you know the Fed's gonna keep dropping this black line. And remember, the red line is just the average of where this black line is going. So if that black line is gonna be low for the next 10 years, 10 years is gonna be low. All right, uh, basically what's my opinion? I kind of say we're more in this category, the A's and the B's, uh, mainly because we do have faster population growth in this country, faster economic growth in say Germany. You know, Germany's actually losing population. They're graying very fast, and they're, same thing with Japan. So we are slightly different in the demographic sense, which is good. Um, so, let's take a look at what the, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, let me, let me cover this. You see this blue line? That's exactly what we just saw on the red line. That's the 10-year treasury. I, like to look, I use this chart in my banking class just to do a little bit of a decomposition, kind of a key word there, the decomposition of the 10-year treasury. I can break that blue line into two components, hence the decomposition. This blue line can be separated into two components, the orange area and the black. And you can see it written up here. Nominal interest rates, the blue, I actually kind of color code it. See the blue is kind of matched up with the blue, is equal to the real interest rate, the black, plus inflation, the orange. So how does this chart work? You take the black number, plus the orange gives you the blue. So here, black at zero, plus the orange gives you the blue there. Or reading across the equation, nominal interest rates are real, plus expected inflation. All right, notice. I said the blue line, the nominal interest rates, the 10-year treasury, has plummeted. I said there's four reasons for that. Well, one of the big reasons, kind of just put it into market, see this black line? That's what we call the real interest rates. Think about in economics, you got supply and demand for money. You got Hans supplying his money, businesses demanding him money, and all that type of thing. Notice real interest rates in this country hit zero this summer. Zero, they bounced up a little bit, but they're still pretty close to zero. Meaning if you buy a 10 year treasury bond, you will not see a real increase in your purchasing power. You are just being covered for inflation. <laughs> this way, notice the in, in interest rate is basically equal to the inflation. Remember orange is inflation. So you're just being compensated for inflation when you buy a 10 year treasury bond. You're actually not getting any real increase in your purchasing power. That's where we're at the summer. It's still basically that today, but notice it has plummeted from being close to 1% real return on your money each year. So you can buy 1% more McDonald's hamburgers, that's all you buy every year, but it's basically it has plummeted. Think of the Hans effect. Here's too much supply of money 
from Hans, not enough demand for money because firms are not borrowing to do a secular stagnation. Too much supply and not enough demand drove it down to zero, which pulls the blue line down. Remember I said, if the black falls here, the blue's got to fall here. Notice inflation has also fallen from the feds. Notice here in 2018, inflation expectations were about 2%. Let me explain this orange a little bit. This is basically what the bond market all those really smart people on Wall Street, all the institutional investors from hedge funds and pension funds and insurance companies, this in 2018, they thought inflation each year for the next 10 years would average about 2%, kind of right at the Fed's target, right? Remember the Fed has a 2% target, but notice in the last year, starting in 2019, it's dropping and dropping, actually hit 1.5. Wait a minute, the Fed's got a 2% target, but the bond market is saying, yeah, we're only going to see about 1.5% inflation each year for the next 10 years. They're saying, nah, we're kind of slowing down here. Remember I had that earlier about we just had expectations of lower inflation. You should ask, hey, Steve, where'd you get that? How do you know what the bond market thinks about inflation in the next 10 years? Well, we know from this chart right here, it's down to 1.5 and still heading lower. So these two things, we had lower inflation, just plus the Hans effect has pushed all our interest rates down in this country. So that's what economists do. We, de we decompose the 10-year treasury into real interest rates have to do with supply and demand, supply and demand for money. But also inflation. What do we expect inflation to be? You add those two together to get the long-term interest rate in this country. All right, uh, let's take it back to the Federal Reserve. Then. Remember, we're holding our Federal Reserve board meeting. This is how the Federal Reserve moves interest rates up and down, going through time. Uh, basically, how does this impact us, you and me? Uh, I see that. This is actually, we've got about one hour now. Before we get into this, this would be a really good time to take a quick 10-minute break, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back and pick this up again. We'll take it back from where we left off talking about the Federal Reserve and lowering their interest rates. So what I have on this chart is actually the Federal Reserve kind of put it as a gray backdrop, if you will. So you have the Fed's raising rates, lowering rates, once again, to dampen that economic business cycle. As we saw, the Federal Reserve has been lowering interest rates from 2.5 to about 1.5 today. So kind of on the down slope again. Um, so how does that impact, say, your local bank and what they're paying you and me on a CD? You know, a lot of us take out one-year CDs for investments. But basically, this blue line right here is the average one-year CD interest rate in this country. And you can see that has peaked also with the Federal Reserve raising. Notice there's a pretty strong correlation. Whatever the Federal Reserve does, your local bank does with their CD interest rates. Very strong correlation. So if a banker was honest and you called him up and say, hey, who sets your one-year CD rate? What should the bankers say? Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve, basically sets it for him. Now that the Fed is lowering interest rates, we're starting to see here, you can see right there, starting to lower CD rates. So we expect in the future, certificates of deposit rates to start to fall. So what are we seeing at banks right now? A lot of their customers are saying, you know what? We expect this blue line to start heading lower in the future. It's probably a good time to lock in those high, relatively high interest rates today. So they're locking in CDs, so banks are seeing a huge flow of money coming into their CD accounts, maybe coming out of their checking accounts or just savings accounts, but they're trying to lock in this relatively high 2% before it actually starts to fall. Uh, yeah, uh, you see the yellow line is what banks pay on a money market deposit account. So you can see that's somewhat correlated. Notice it moves up when the Fed raises rates, when the Fed's lowering that gray area, that yellow line comes down. So it does kind of track, there's some symmetry to it. It's not as sensitive as the blue line, so we call it less rate sensitive money. CD money is, because that's more for investment purposes. And then the last one is just a regular savings account, or we call a share account. Basically, that's really low today. Well, basically, what you get on a regular savings account at a bank, pretty much close to zero. Even though the Fed raised rates nine times, we really didn't see any movement on a basic savings account rate. All right, so there's what we have in the past. It's always good to see how things have related in the past, what the correlation is to what banks do. Now, let's take a look at the future. I want you guys to all play the economist. Where do you think, what do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do for the next, say, four years with respect to interest rates. Now, let's just assume we have that growth recession coming up in about a year or so. 
If we do have a growth recession, what do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do with interest rates? Lower them. Okay. The question is, do we lower them? I mean, like I said, put yourself in the shoes of Jerome Powell. This is what they talk about when they meet every six weeks. Do we lower them again basically to zero like we did here? Notice that gray area is pretty close to zero. That's the Great Recession. If we just have a more garden variety recession, that's what we had back in 2001 when the Fed lowered interest rates to 1%. That was enough to get us out of the recession. So, let me ask you, should we lower them to 1% if we have a growth recession coming up next year? Or should we lower them to 0% if we have a really bad recession? What do you think, one or zero? All right, let's go with 1%. All right, so we go to 1% here, maybe on 21, 22. Then the economy naturally heals itself, remember. We'll get back up to that 3% growth by maybe the year 2023. If you raise interest rates, remember, what is the goal for you to raise interest rates to in the long run? What's that normal interest rate again for the Fed funds rate? Two and a half. So let's try to hit two and a half in the out year. All right, with, just a, with, it, with that little simple economic analysis, notice I put in this gray area here for 2021, 22, 23, 24. We just create an economic forecast for interest rates. If we do go into recession, say in the second half of 2020, that little growth recession, the Fed will keep, you know, we're, right, we're right there now, the Fed will go from basically 1.6 down to 1% with the Fed funds rate, helps stimulate the economy, banks lower their interest rates on motorcycles and car loans, people start spending again. The economy recovers, the Fed brings it back up to 2.5 right there, reading it across, similar to where we were this summer. So notice the U-shaped pattern there. The U-shaped pattern here, similar to the U-shaped pattern we saw with the economy and the growth of the economy. All right, so there's our forecast, a little bit of a slow. And so basically, interest rates for the next two or three years will be lower than what they were this summer. That's kind of what we have forecasted. That we could see lower rates. All right, moving on. This is a chart on our deficit. We've talked about that. You guys, we've talked about it before. This is the federal government surplus or deficit. Basically, in 2019, we ran about a $1.1 trillion deficit. Remember, I used that example of we spend about $4 trillion. We only tax about $3 trillion, so about a trillion-dollar hole to fill. And then forecasting out through 2027, where the, basically the deficits just get bigger and bigger and bigger each year. The Congressional Budget Office, that nonpartisan uh, 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 congressional arm, is forecasting a $1.4 trillion deficit by the year 2027. Uh, once again, the CBO does not forecast recessions. They basically just forecast the economy growing at 2%. No, they use that 2% number also. Economy naturally grows 2%. They don't try to forecast the cycles. But if we do go into a recession sometime in, say, the next seven, eight years, what do you think is going to happen to the length of these bars? They're going to get a lot bigger. Like, well, here's, here's the recession of 08, 09. Look what happened to our deficit, 318, 248, 161. Boom, 1.4 trillion. But of course, that was the great recession. 10% unemployment, a lot of people not working, so they weren't paying taxes. A lot of people on, say, uh, insurance benefits and, and safety net. So we had government spending shoot way up. But you no, know, so that was a very significant recession. But the point is, expect these bars to get a lot bigger if we do go into recession. Now, is this a problem right now? Now, we're running deficits. Do you hear many people in Congress, Senate, even the President, talk about our deficit? When was the last time you heard a, a, a politician say the word deficit? Even though this is like the biggest deficits we've seen, I mean, should we, should we actually be running a deficit right now? No, because no, I, mean, I can describe this economy in three words. Fantastic. This is a fantastic economy. Remember, we're operating at 2% positive gap. Harley's operating at 2% above normal. We've got overtime people where we can't find workers, you know, da 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 da. We should be running a surplus right now. Not a we should be doing this. Remember back in uh, the last few years of the Clinton administration, we actually ran a surplus where we taxed more than we spent. We actually brought in more money. That was a long time ago. We've been running deficits since then. Are these deficits hurting our economy? Are these deficits hurting our economy right now? No, they're not. They're not. They're actually stimulating the economy. That's one reason why we had 3% growth last year, because we had big 
deficit. This is a fiscal stimulus taking place right now. How would big deficits hurt your economy? What's the economic causation, the chain of logic, if you will? Big deficits should, according to economic theory textbooks, lead to what? Higher interest rates. Remember, the most important price in any economy, interest rates. Big deficits, because the government is borrowing so much money, should push up interest rates. Higher interest rates do what to your economy? Do businesses borrow a lot when interest rates are, say, 10%? No. no. So you got less business investment, less you know, investment in new technologies, so productivity growth starts to slow down. Slower productivity growth. Remember, that was one of my variables that determines how fast our economy grows in the long run. Remember, we grow at 2% right now. Well, lower productivity would lead to that secular stagnation. So that's the chain of events. According to economic theory textbooks, high deficits lead to high interest rates, which means that businesses invest less, productivity growth slows down, and your economy stagnates. Well, do we have that first chain in the link? Are interest rates too high? No, they're too low. They're just the opposite. So deficits right now do not matter. They are not slowing the economy down in any way. In fact, they are stimulating the economy. But the economists are asking the question, when will they impact the economy? When will deficits start to push up interest rates, slowing the economy down and leading to what Lawrence Summers, the economist from Harvard, said was secular stagnation? Right now, they're not. And as long as the world has a surplus of savings, or what we call the savings glut, it's going to keep interest rates low. So most economists say, yeah, going out to at least 2027 here, no, we got so much savings in the world and little investment, they're not going to, they're not going to matter through 2027. So our government just keeps borrowing and just keeps spending. Our debt keeps growing higher and higher and higher. But right now, they're not impacting someday when the millennials replace us and the baby boomers are gone and they're spending, but that's probably 10 years into the future. For right now, it's not a p impact in the economy. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Add this number to the total debt, add this number next year to the total debt. Keeps rising to 22 trillion, 23 trillion, 25 trillion, yeah. Keeps getting higher and higher. Fortunately, we can service this debt. What am I talking about there when we're talking about debt servicing? We've got to pay the interest on the debt. But what's happening to interest rates today are very low. So because of the, what's happening, the European Central Bank keeping interest rates low there, Hans bringing all his money here keeps our interest rates low. When the government has to pay you and me interest on these bonds, they're not paying us very much. So the debt servicing on, these, on this money is not that big. But if interest rates do go back up, just think of what the cost will be of running by then a $30 trillion debt and you're paying 8% on $30 trillion instead of 2% today. So that's another factor. We'll crowd out government spending. We'll be spending so much money on interest, we won't have money to spend on building our roads and bridges or the military. But right now, they are not matter. Uh, moving on, vehicle sales. One of the big industries in the United States, of course, cars, selling cars, building cars. How are we doing on that? Uh, basically, where's my goal line on this? We should be selling about 16 and a half million cars. That's to keep pace with population growth, growth in incomes, stock prices, things like that. We should be selling 16.5 million. You see my goal line. Notice the last few years, we've been doing better than that. This has been what I like to call the halcyon days for the auto, auto industry. Halcyon meaning prosperous and good and relatively calm. All right, these have been good years, but what's our forecast? Notice I got my little green right there. That's my forecast. It's slowing down. We forecast, we're forecasting what we call a reversion to the mean. Think of this goal line as the mean or the long run average. We expect a little bit of a slowdown and then actually keep dropping. You should say, wait a minute, Steve, didn't you say by 2023, the economy will come roaring back? I said, yeah. By 2023, remember that U-shaped will have a strong economy. But you say, wait a minute, but you're saying car sales will actually be the worst in 2023. So the business cycle will be expanding by then, but car sales will be weaker. So there must be some other factor in play here. What's the other factor? What are we seeing transforming the auto industry today? 
got, you know, there's ride sharing and soon autonomous vehicles and all this, where people are saying, you know what, I don't really want to buy a car anymore. I don't want to spend $40,000 on an asset. I want just the service of getting from A to B. So either through Uber, or autonomous vehicles, or wherever, or just having some company offering a ride for me to get from home to work or whatever. So we're actually, according to the futurists who study the auto industry more than I do, they say we've probably reached a peak on car sales in this country. And they'll just slowly start to decline as say that millennial generation doesn't buy the two or three cars that you and me baby boomers used to have. They're going to be downsized and have fewer cars if they live in, city, live in cities, have no cars at all and just get around with Uber or public transportation. So we're expecting slower and slower car sales as we move through the future. What about, what about homes, mortgages, existing home sales, things like that? My next chart is looking at existing home sales in the United States. Are you buying my house? Am I buying your house? Are we swapping existing homes? Uh, once again, where's my gold line? Where's my 98.6 degree body temperature where the economy wants to be at in the long run? Notice on this axis, this is in thousands, it's kind of hard to see that, but that's, so that's five million there because it's in thousands. If we sell about five million homes, that's pretty good. If you're talking to the National Association of Realtors, they say, yeah, five million keeps pace of population growth, all that good stuff. Uh, notice the last few years, we've been running slightly above that gold line. Not too much above, just slightly above. Not like we were, say, 15 years ago, back in 04, 05. This was your housing boom. When we were selling, what, 7 million homes were being bought and sold, when we should have been doing 5 million. Whenever economists see charts like this, when the actual number is so far away from where it should be, you start sweating. You start having trouble sleeping at night. You're thinking, this is not going to end well. That's like your body temperature being 140 degrees instead of, you know, the 98.6. This is not going to end well, so we went from the boom to the kaboom here, and then we've slowly climbed our way back, hit that 5 million line, went a little bit above, which is good. Like I said, economists don't mind gaps like this. We're running a little bit hot, but not too bad in the housing market. What's the forecast for the next few years with respect to homes and housing, and how's that market going to be doing? We see the blue line there. The blue is the forecast going out through 2023 here. Notice it'll slow. Why? because of possible growth recession. Whenever you have a growth recession, people lose a little confidence, and so home demand will drop off a little bit. But then by 22, 23, the economy's coming back, confidence is back up, and people start buying homes again. So there's the natural business cycle. There's my U shape that we've been talking about. There's the U. But you can say, wait a minute, Steve. You never drop below your goal line. So we're basically saying, yeah, we have the business cycle playing out. But something's going to keep us elevated, so we, we can call it a good year every year. You know, this is going to be a good year because it's higher than the gold. That's a good year, higher than the gold. Good year, good year. Why is it going to remain good, even though there's a little business cycle playing out? Something else is happening out there. Think of demographics. Demographics. You got baby boomers, Generation X, millennials. But there's a lot of millennials out there right now. There's like some 80-some million millennials. What's the average age of a millennial? I mean, millennials are the biggest demographic group. They outnumber baby boomers. Now, we were the biggest uh, population group, the baby boomers. But we're, you know, we're dying off, so anyway, we're losing. But the millennials are now the biggest. 80-some million of them. What's their age range about? 25 to 39. That's the prime home buying years. They're finally getting into that age where they're getting married, starting to buy homes, have kids, doing all that stuff. So the reason we say the blue is going to stay above the gold so we can say it's going to be good housing, that's the millennial effect. It's keeping us above the long run average because there's so many of them looking to buy homes. What's the biggest, you know, if you're talking to any realtor today, what's the biggest issue with the housing market today? Nothing's for sale. There's very limit, limited supply or inventory homes. Demand's there. You got all these millennials out there shopping, but there's just little for sale. So what's happening with home prices? How fast are home prices going up? Five, six percent? Yeah, we'll look at that chart in a minute. So home prices are rising just because there's very little limited supply out there, but all these millennials are shopping and other people shopping, but you can't find homes. All right, uh, let's take a look at stock prices. Hey, how's the stock market been doing this year? Um, well, I've had to, uh, you know, you, you hear, hear this phrase, things are off the charts. Well, it went off my chart. Basically, my chart last year, I think I had my chart 
uh, went to the high of 3,000 here on the S&P 500 stock index. Well, we went off the chart, we went above that recently, so I had to increase my axis now to 3,250. It's off the chart, so stock prices reach new record highs, getting higher and higher and higher. Um, I always like to ask you, are stock prices overvalued? Can I answer that question by looking at where we're at? So you can see we're at about, what, 3,125. I don't know where we're at today, but when I updated my chart last. Is this overvalued? Is this kind of getting out of control here? You can see we're a lot higher today than we were back in 07 before that recession, 01 before that recession. You notice how it goes. Stock prices go up, you get a recession, they come down. Stock prices go up, you get a recession, falls 30%. Stock prices go up and up and up and up. Overvalued? Can I answer that question by looking at this chart? No. no. One, I've got to adjust for inflation. You see the green line I just added? We call that the real. You know, economists always use the word real when we're saying we adjust for inflation. Remember I talked about Harley-Davidson raising the price of their motorcycles by maybe two, three, four percent because of rising labor costs? But what if Harley raises the price two percent every year, right? Remember, the Fed wants prices to go up 2% each year. So that means that Harley-Davidson motorcycle goes up 2% each year. That means Harley-Davidson's revenues go up roughly 2% each year. That means their profits probably go up 2% each year. So their stock price should roughly go up 2% each year, just normally. Not doing anything, it's just going to rise 2%. So I can't compare today's stock price with what it was, say, back in 2001 because you just got natural inflation. You can't look at it in nominal terms. You got to adjust for inflation. So if I do that, I use my green line. The green line is adjusting for that 2% inflation roughly each year. So notice, even back then in 2001, during the dot-com boom versus where we're at today, basically stock prices, and even in real terms, the highest they've ever been. I mean, if you sell your stocks today, and you wanted to go out and buy a big basket of goods and services, you can buy more goods and services than you ever could before with this basket of goods. So your real purchasing power, the real quantity of stuff you can buy is the highest it's ever been when you sell your stocks. But are they overvalued? Are too high? Well, no, the only way they can answer that is with this blue line, the price earnings ratio. What are we paying in price to have a claim on one dollar of a company's earnings? That's the price earnings ratio. What are we paying? You can see where we're at today, what? 30, we're paying, there it is, the blue on this axis is 30. We're paying $30 in the stock price to have a claim on $1 of a company's profits. Is that high or low versus, say, the last 20 some years? Well, if we put in the 25 year average PE, over the last 25 years, see on my chart here, 25 year average P is around 27. Well, we're at 30, 27 is there. There's a little bit of a gap there, a little bit of maybe you know, been overpriced, but nothing significant. You know, similar to where we were in 04, 05, 06. Notice the blue was kind of hugging that gold line. Here is where we had the bubble. Look at the blue versus the gold. Look at the difference right there, that gap. Once again, when every economy see gaps that big, we say, that's a bubble. It was. Our, our 401ks quickly turned into 201ks as stock prices came crashing down, because that was overvalued. But you look at today, ah, we're at 30 versus 27. A little bit of a gap there. So our, when people say stock price is overvalued, yeah, when you look at the long run, P raised last 25 years, 27. So we pay, what, $27 to buy $1 of a company's profits. We're at 30 today, so not much of a bubble there. Once again, you don't want to look at it in nominal terms, don't want to look at it in real terms. You always want to use ratios. Economists love ratios. A numerator and a denominator. And what's that old saying? There's a fine line that separates numerators from denominators. <laughs> Economist joke right there. All right. Uh, so basically the fine line is, you know, we're kind of at long run average here, so not much to worry about there. Uh, uh, now, some risks though. What keeps economists up at night? I have here, these are in your notes, the top 10 risks to the markets in 2021. We still have rising wealth, income, and healthcare inequality in this country. So the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting basically stagnant. Number two, that trade war uncertainty is freezing up a lot of business investment spending. They're saying, hey, why build a new factory and figure out what's going on with this trade war? 
Uh, so it's rating out what's called corporate capital expenditures, or CapEx. Number three, slow growth in China. Japan, Europe leads to a dollar appreciation. Yeah, remember, here's that Europe. There's my Hans effect. Slow growth in Europe. Hans says, why invest in Europe? Let's invest in the United States. The cleanest shirt and the hamper, basically. Money is coming here, which pushes up our dollar. But like I said, if you're Harley Davidson, do you want the value of the dollar to go up? A higher value of the dollar, Harley Davidson, it's really hard to sell motorcycles in Canada. Canadians just go out and buy Honda motorcycles. They stop buying Harleys because their dollar's too expensive. Remember, the dollar goes up 20%. That, that Harley Davidson motorcycle went up 20% to a Canadian buyer. So that's going to hurt our exports. Number four, the U.S. election uncertainty. We're bringing a little bit of politics here, just in the talking about whenever you have an election, it creates uncertainty. Why? Well, uh, we don't know what's going to happen if you know, Trump gets reelected. What will his future policies be? There's uncertainty there, so people hold off. Uh, if one of the Democrats get elected from you know, Elizabeth Warren to Biden to whoever, we don't know what their policies will be. So a lot of, once again, that word uncertainty is the big word out there right now. People say, well, let's just wait to see who's going to be president, what their policies are, both in taxing and spending. Uh, and also, of course, with re uh, regulation, deregulation, or more regulation, that affects capital expenditures, or CapEx, business investment. Number four, foreigners lose appetite for U.S. credit and treasuries following the election. Uh, this would be, say, if, uh, uh, if so someone got in power who basically wanted to increase the deficit significantly. That may spook the market, so you may see some foreigners say, well, maybe when I say credit, I'm just talking about corporate bonds there. So they stop buying our corporate bonds and stop buying our treasuries because they're worried we're going to have runaway deficits even bigger than the chart we saw earlier from the CBO. Number six, uh, modern monetary theory. Anybody heard this phrase, modern monetary theory? Raise your hand if you've heard the phrase modern monetary theory. Uh, style of fiscal expansion boosts growth. Basically, modern monetary theory, in the, in the summarize, basically deficits don't matter. If we're running a trillion dollars today, let's just go to two and three trillion dollar in deficits. Kind of what Japan has done the last 30 years, just to run massive deficits. Has that hurt Japan? Has Japan interest rates gone up? No, they're negative. So it's actually kind of, you know, work for Japan to run massive deficits with no negative consequences yet. I don't need to put the yet in there. But basically, that's modern monetary theory. Just run big deficits, pay for free college, pay for Medicare, pay for all this stuff. And just run deficits because it's not pushing up interest rates. Uh, number seven, U.S. debt levels begin to push up interest rates. Here's, that, here's where economic theory kind of steps in and says, yes, if you keep running debt, you will push up interest rates. So economists are starting to talk about it more and more. And then we start starting to talk to the politicians and the staff of the politicians saying, there's going to be a point when interest rates will rise because of our debt. Number eight, more negative yielding debt sends global investors buying U.S. credit and treasuries. Are we going to see more and more countries around the world having negative interest rates? Remember I said, how many countries have it today? Six. What if it goes to eight, ten? What if 12 countries next year have negative interest rates? That just means more money is going to flow to the United States, which is going to push our interest rates even lower. So once again, there it is. They keep buying our credit, meaning corporate bonds, and our treasuries pushing those interest rates even lower. Number nine, declining corporate profits. We've already seen that. You know, profits are not growing at the same pace as they were in the past. That means there's less dollars available for stock buybacks. One factor that's been pushing up that S&P 500 to record levels has been what? Stock buybacks. You know, we had that big corporate tax cut in 2018. What did corporations do with that big tax cut? They had all these profits that used to have to go to the government, but now they, kept, they, they were able to keep them because of the lower tax rate. What did they do with all these extra profits that they had, this big windfall? Did they go on and build new factories? No. What did they do with it? They bought, back a lot, bought back a lot of their own stock, which helped push up stock prices. Also, the profits have been decent the last few years, which they use it to buy back stocks. So we're worried if profits start to slow down, they won't have enough money and you could see stock prices fall just because they're not buying back their stock anymore. And then the last one, oh, here it is, that house price crash in Australia and Canada. There's big bubbles right now in the Canadian and Australian home prices. If they pop, similar to what we saw 10 years ago, 
their home prices would crash, their stock market would crash, and it would put them into a recession. So you got you know, two of our bigger trading partners, Canada is one of our biggest trading partners, if they go into a recession, it would hurt our economy because they buy a lot of our stuff from us. Did anybody see, what was the job growth number in uh, Canada last month? Like I said, we created what, 266,000? That's a pretty good number. Basically, the kind of rule of thumb for that, about 130,000. If you create 130,000 jobs each month, that keeps pace with population growth. That will keep your unemployment rate constant. So economists say, yeah, if you hit 130,000, that's good. Anything above that, that's gravy. You know, you're doing better than that. We had 266. We were double the 130. So it was a great month for us. What's the population? What's the population in the United States? Like 330 million. What's the population of Canada? Like 37 million. You know, roughly one tenth. What happened to Canadian jobs last month? Anybody see that number? Did it go up or down? It went down. Remember, 130 for us is good. It went down by over 70,000. And remember, they got one-tenth the population of us. That is a huge negative number. Now, I don't know if it's just a one-off, something might have happened in Canada, but it dropped. So we're worried about if Canada is already going into recession, that will hurt us because, once again, if their incomes are weak, they're not buying our Harley-Davidson motorcycles and our wheat and everything else we sell to them. So we're worried about what's going on in the rest of the world. And of course, here's the top 10 things that keep economists that we'll be talking about for the next few months. All right, uh, home prices, how home prices during, of course, one of the biggest assets that you and I own. As we said earlier, home price the last few years has been rising about 6%, which is nice. Uh, what's the forecast for home prices? We expect home price growth to slow a little bit here to about 3.5% in the next few years. Basically, we can't keep growing at 6%. Why can't we? Why can't home prices go 6% forever? Wouldn't that be nice if your home went up 6% each year? Why can't it keep going up 6% each year? In the long run, home prices should grow as fast as incomes. How fast are incomes growing right now? About 3%. The average American gets about 3% raise. Like here at CUNY Mutual across the street, we'll probably give most of our employees a 3% raise this year. That's what we've been seeing the last few years, 3%. But notice, home prices have been going up 6%. Well, is that sustainable? No, in the long run, if home prices keep going 6%, but incomes only grow 3 in the long run, nobody will be able to afford a home. And of course, that's nonsensical. That's absurd. So it can't keep growing at that pace. So we're forecasting a home price growth to slow to 3.5% as wage growth rises to roughly 3.5%, and they equalize again. So it has to slow down. It can't keep at that pace. It'll, it'll basically outprice everybody in the market. Uh, oh, moving on. One good news that we've seen, a real change in, in, in the U.S. economy, is the national savings rate. National savings rate. You can see on this chart, we're at what? There's about 8%. Let me kind of put this into terms you can wrap our brains around. Let's say uh, you make $125,000 a year. That's your income, $125,000. Let's say you pay 20% of that to the government. $25,000 goes to the federal government, say taxes, whatever. So you're left with $100,000. And let's say you save $8,000 in your 401k. All right, that's 8% savings rate. So you make $125,000, pay 20% of the government, you've got $100,000 left, you save $8,000 in your 401k. That's what the national savings rate is at today up from where it was just a few years ago. No, so we're about 3%. Right before the Great Recession, the last housing boom, we all were buying homes, filling them up with furniture, nobody was saving, dropped to 3%, but it's slowly been rising higher and higher and higher to 8 So this is kind of good news. You, know, you want to save. Savings is good, right? We're up to 8%, but what's causing that? Can you tell me what's causing the increase in the savings rate today? Well, let me give you another little quiz. This is a question actually from my class in macroeconomics. Let me throw it out at you. Why has the national savings rate rose over 8% recently? Was it due to the tax cuts in 2018? Left a little bit more money in our you know, paychecks at the end of the month, deposited at, say, Summit Credit Union or UW Credit Union or Associated Bank or whatever. Disinflation, prices are falling. So if things cost less, you got more money, you can save that. Rising GDP and income. Hey, the economy is just booming. People are getting more incomes. They can save that extra income. Widening, widening income inequality. You know, if more of our income goes to the rich people, 
Rich people typically save more than poor people. Let's think of a poor person, someone who makes 30,000 a year, they spend every dollar they make. They save nothing. But if you give another $100,000 to Bill Gates, what does he save out of that extra 100,000? He saves it all. He's got 100% savings rate, he basically, any, any extra money he gets. So basically, the, the widening income inequality in this country, you actually get a higher savings rate. Uh, aging demographics, we're getting more and more older people, more gray hairs in our society, which typically save more, is that a factor? And then the last one, just fears of recession. You know, this summer, a lot of people are talking about inverted yield curves, typically lead to recessions. We talked about that earlier. So if people are just fearing a recession, they say, you know what, I better kind of build up a little nest egg just in case I lose my job, I got money to set aside. All right, A, B, C, D, E, F, what do you think is leading to the higher savings rate? Yeah, it's actually G, all of the above. Economists are tracking all of these things, all of them are pushing up the savings rate to 8%. Okay, uh, moving on, consumer confidence is really high right now. People are feeling good about the economy, feeling good about their jobs. This is a consumer confidence index, sitting about 130. You know, we just kind of take an average of, we survey people, we ask them, how do you feel about the economy? They reply back, we turn their survey results into an index number, so we can compare today versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So you can see, we're basically kind of back to where we were back during Bill Clinton, back in 1998, 99, when we were running surpluses and stock prices were high and everything was good. Uh, we ask people, why are you feeling so optimistic? Why are you going out and spending and doing all this stuff? And they say, well, we like low gas prices. That makes me feel good. I don't want to be spending all this money in the gas pump. I like driving away from the gas pump with a little bit of cash in my wallet. Number two, they love low interest rates. They love going into a bank and getting a mortgage loan at 3.7 and a car loan at 3%. They like low retail inflation. The prices of things that we buy. Remember I said economics is a study of production of goods and services? Goods make up 15% of our economy. 85% of the economy is services. When you're looking at the 15% of the goods part of the economy, prices there are flat or falling. Things that you can buy when you go to the mall and put in a bag and put it in the trunk of your car, the goods part of the economy, prices are falling or flat. It's only in the service part of the economy, which is 85% of the economy, where prices are rising. What service is rising the fastest that we all hear about on the news? Healthcare. Healthcare costs was a big part of the service part of the economy. Those costs are rising, which is why we have 2% inflation, because we kind of have deflation over here, stuff that you buy like clickers and coats and, and podiums, those prices are flat or stagnant. Uh, so they like low retail inflation, they like going to say Sears and buying stuff at a cheaper price than it was a year ago. They like this rising, remember stock prices, record highs in the last few days. Home prices, record highs and keep going up 6% a year. Labor markets at full employment, hey, if you want a job today, you can get a job today. Low debt burdens, improving credit availability. You go into a bank today, you're more likely to be approved for a loan than denied for a loan, especially compared to 10 years ago. And then the last one, tax cuts. You put these eight things together, Americans are feeling great and they're keeping their spending up, which is driving the economy forward for now. Which, um, let me just skip over this real quick, we're running out of time. Um, when I teach my macroeconomics class and banking class, there's one economic truism I try to bring up in every lecture. You know, I teach you know, two lectures a week for macro, two lectures for banking. It's this, economics is the study of the confusion between stocks and flows. Stocks, of course, just represent balance sheets, how much you are worth, say, right now, versus the flow, which is income. Say, remember I talked about flow before with Harley-Davidson producing cars and stuff like motorcycles? You got the income statement, the balance sheet, stocks and flows, that's what economics is all about, studying those two things. Well, I want to take a balance sheet item, compare it to an income statement item. Once again, make a ratio. We love ratios, numerators, denominators. Basically, it's this right here. I'm looking at household financial assets. That's from the balance sheet, the stock concept in economics. And I'm going to divide it by disposable household income. Disposable means just after tax. Remember I said I make $125,000 a year, say, pick $25,000 to government, I got $100,000 left of disposable income to do with what I will. So I'm taking an asset divided by an income, a balance sheet divided by an income statement, and I get this chart here. It's basically saying that right now, assets are worth about 580% of income. Translation, let's put this in easy numbers. Let's say I make $100,000 a year. 
Let's say I have 580,000 in my 401k. Take 580,000 401k divided by 100,000 income, give me a ratio of about 580%. Notice how high that has risen recently. The long run average, once again, economists love these long run numbers here, about 450% is the long run average. We're at 580 today. So it's basically saying those financial assets, stocks and bonds, are really highly valued relative to the income that's generating that. Think of the numerator here, financial assets, that's Wall Street, that's New York City. Think of the denominator, the income, that's Milwaukee. That's Harley Davidson's factory producing income by selling motorcycles and making a profit. So it looks like today at this very high number, Wall Street is highly valued relative to Main Street versus the profits that are generating those assets. So I come back here, once again, economics is a study of the confusion between stocks and flows. Well, I had a stock versus a flow. The financial assets on Wall Street divided by the flow of income from Harley Davidson Main Street. So I can say I've got my balance sheet in the stock divided by my income statement, the flow. Or I can say my financial assets relative to my income, assets are really high relative to my income. My 401k, 580,000, my 401k versus my $100,000 income. Or I could say Wall Street is highly valued relative to Main Street when you include both stocks and bonds. And it's mainly the bonds that are pushing up this ratio. Because we saw earlier, you know, stocks is my financial, it's not that highly priced, but it's the bonds. Why are bonds so highly priced? What happened to interest rates? Interest rates have come way down. As we know, it pushes bond prices way up. So we have a little bit of a discrepancy between Wall Street and Main Street today when looking at this chart right here at 580,000. That's what keeps economists up at night. This seems really high, mainly due to bond prices being really high, due to interest rates being very low. And if interest rates ever do go back up because we have a get rid of the glut of world savings or the European Central Banks actually brings interest rates back to positive, then you see interest rates rise again. Bond prices come crashing down, and you'll see this start to come back down. Just like we saw, let me bring in my, oops, where's my long run average? Bring it back to the long run average here. Because like I said, we always kind of revert back to the mean in the long run. And we're worried about this reverting to the mean. If interest rates ever do go back up, those bond prices will come down. All right, with that, we're right at 12, but I'll just open up for any comments, questions, snide remarks. Yes, sir. Because we're building apartments uh, uh, all over Madison to bring in 40,000 people in the next 10 years to yep. Madison, how does that figure into housing prices and whether that's part of the measurement? Um, well, yeah, we, 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 kinda, we, see, we have a separate between apartment complexes and single family homes. So basically, if you're creating more apartment complexes, that will reduce the demand for single family homes, which will actually depress the growth rate of single family housing. So it actually slow that down, but it still has to do with total uh, supply and demand. How many people are moving in with families that want a single family home? So basically, population growth is always good for prices, but if we're allocating it more towards apartments and high density home housing, like we see in the downtown, downtown area, where a lot of the epic people are moving in, and if they're just reducing the demand for single family homes, that will depress it. But I think just having more people move into society always pushes up prices and keeps them elevated. So we don't expect home prices to go negative if you have positive population growth. So that's why Madison's always pretty stable with our growth rate in home prices. Any other questions? Yes, way in the back. Typically the Fed has lowered interest rates to fight recessions. Uh, with interest rates so low now, have they removed that tool from their uh, bag? Very good. Everybody says, you know, if the, if the Fed funds rates only at 1.6, they don't get very much room to get down to zero to help stimulate the economy. So a lot of people say, well, is fiscal policy or monetary policy basically kind of running out of bullets or ammunition? Well, the answer is no. They can push the Fed funds rate down to zero like they did during the last seven, eight years after the Great Recession. But their second tool was what? Quantitative easing. QE, which is just fancy econ talk for printing up money to buy bonds. So then they buy long-term bonds, which then pushes the 10-year treasury down even further. But as we know, that's only at 1.8. That's getting close to zero. But then there's a third way. They can keep printing up so much money 
that it pushes up inflation expectations. Remember that orange chart we saw earlier? If inflation expectations start to rise, that actually pushes down what we call the real interest rate. And if the real interest rate goes negative, that can help stimulate the economy. Now, I agree, the Fed's kind of running out of ammunition, but they can keep pushing interest rates into negative territory, which can help the economy keep growing. Uh, but it is becoming less and less effective. You know, when interest rates are at six, seven, eight percent, you lower them to three, that stimulates the economy. But the Fed still has tools. Now, once monetary policy is done, we're into negative interest rates, then the, the fiscal has to come into play. Fiscal policy. We can start borrowing more money and basically you know, fiscal expansion, build more roads, bridges, highways, electrical grids, water systems, that type of deal. And that's probably what we'll have to rely on. More fiscal policy and less monetary policy for the next election. Yes? G given that we <clears throat> have a, a big deficit already annual, uh, is it realistic to think that we can address the infrastructure problem in a massive way that we seem to all agree needs to be done? Or With is, more deficit? Yeah, still more deficit, right? Uh, like I said, in the short one, yes, we can. We, we could easily go to, for a $1 trillion deficit now or 1.1. We could easily go to 1.3, 1.4 trillion and borrow another 300 billion for infrastructure rebuilding. That would have no impact on either interest rates and it would actually help the economy and help rebuild a lot of our decaying infrastructure. So that's what a lot of people say, hey, if interest rates are this low, this is now the time to borrow money because interest rates are so low. Don't wait 10 years from now when interest rates go back up to 10% to borrow money to build roads and bridges. Borrow the money now and build the roads and bridges now because one, building new roads and bridges helps the economy. So the economy will grow and so you get a bigger tax base and actually pay back that debt. So let's build our ports, let's rebuild our, air, our airports and our roads and bridges to actually build a bigger economy to fund more taxes to pay down the debt. Yes? Are, are you seeing the beginnings of building climate change into your charts because of, of wildfires, floods, and hurricanes creating a huge um, economic loss to sure. those people? Um, to, to answer your question, um, that's kind of the part of the overall slowing growth. Remember I said, when I started studying economics, we used to go three and a half and then slowing down. So we kind of say it's more of a long-term effect. So it's not like our GDP number next year is going to drop, but just a slowing in the overall growth rate of the economy when you have to factor in more losses of our stock. Remember I said economics is a study that confused between stocks and flows? Let me take it back to that. When you have more forest fires or Houston's where the flooding comes in, takes out half the city, you're ruining the stock part of your economy. The factories, the offices, the buildings that need to re be replaced, you're kind of tearing those down, which works on the stock, which kind of erodes, kind of like termites, if you will, attacking your house. Kind of makes things a little unstable, kind of reduces your overall infrastructure, reduces the stock part of the economy, which is what you need to build things in the economy. It'd be like Harley Davidson's factory shrinking a little bit. They won't be able to produce as much. So the stock does erode with cap with the whole climate change idea. So that's how we would factor it in there. Yes. Uh, part of the uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a major uh, set of discussions about changing for the, the world's reserve currency from the dollar to something else. Is that still anywhere in play at all? And if so, uh, how much of the bene how much of the U.S.'s economy is dependent? on being the world reserve currency? Uh, very good, the, the question has to do with the world, we are the world's reserve currency, the dollar. Most international trade is done with the dollar. So say for example, when Germany buys oil from Saudi Arabia, they don't actually pay Saudi Arabia in euros, they pay it in dollars. So all the German banks in Germany have to hold dollars. So when Siemens Corporation in Germany wants to buy that oil, that German bank, Deutsche Bank, has to hold a lot of dollars because that Siemens customer wants to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. So every bank around the world has to hold dollar reserves or money in the vault, if you will. That's why, that's why we're called the reserve currency. Everybody has to hold dollars in their bank vault around the world to do these international trades, which, now if you're a bank in Germany, if you're Deutsche Bank, and you have to hold millions and millions of dollars, you just don't want those dollars sitting in your vault, right? You want to have those millions of dollars invested in something, maybe treasury bills. They're short term, if you need the cash, you can sell a treasury bill very quickly, you call up your broker dealer. So all, think of Deutsche Bank, has to buy a lot of US treasury bills. 
as an investment to earn a little bit of interest while they're waiting for Siemens to withdraw some of that money to buy oil. But that forces Deutsche Bank to buy treasury bills. So what does that do to our interest rates? If you increase the supply of something, what does it do to its price? You increase supply of money buying our bonds, pushes our interest rates down. So because we're the world's reserve currency and Deutsche Bank has to hold dollars, which means they have to hold T-bills, we have artificially low interest rates in the United States. If someday the whole world said, you know what, let's stop using the dollar for world trade. Let's use the euro or the yen or some other currency. What would happen to our interest rates? Germany would say, well, let's sell these treasury bills. They want to sell them. Basically, we get our money back. Our interest rates would rise significantly. So we do benefit that after World War II, we kind of set up the system. We're going to use the dollar for the world trade because we're the most powerful country in the world. We could do that. Well, it's kept our interest rates abnormally low. But if they ever went away, it would jump up interest rates. It would hurt our economy because we'd have higher rates, businesses would invest less, less productivity. Now, the question is, is there any substitute for the dollar? Will they ever say, ah, let's stop using the dollar to, for world trade? No, there's no substitute. Right now, and I'd say for the next seven, eight, ten years, we will continue to use the dollar for international trade, which means Deutsche Bank will have to keep holding dollars and buying T-bills and keep our interest rates low. So right now, there is no substitute. Anything else? Yes. About measuring inflation as represented by the CPI, Consumer Price Index. Uh, that seems, the 2% often mentioned seems to be low by my experience. Uh, certainly restaurant food is a lot more expensive each year than that. Healthcare, etc. Uh, wasn't there some time, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, when actually the CPI definition was modified by eliminating certain components, maybe it was oil or I forgot what, and is that uh, a way of the government uh, to kind of pull the hood over us? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would disagree with the idea that the government's trying to manipulate the numbers to keep artificially low. For one, the actual chart I presented was not the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, but was the PCE, which is what the Federal Reserve uses, which stands for Personal Consumption Expenditure, which is a different measure of the prices that you and I pay on a personal level, what we consume and expend on. That's a, actually a different measure of the rate of inflation. So there is a CPI, which is a separate index, versus the PCE, but the Federal Reserve uses the PCE because they believe that's a more accurate reading. And to your point, have they changed the CPI? Yeah, they change it all the time because new goods are coming in and out, what you and I buy. You know, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. So now they have to bring the iPhone into something that we buy to calculate percent change in prices. But the PCE is something that's a little bit more stable because it includes everything we purchase. So there's no things not being added in or out. So the Federal Reserve uses the PCE measure of inflation. And that's what I had earlier at running about 1.8%. And it has been relatively stable. You mentioned like some food prices go up. We always kind of focus on the things that go up and forget about the things that go down. And like I said, prices for goods are actually flat or falling. It's mainly the service prices that have been going up. But overall, we've been having about 2% inflation in the last few years. So, no, uh, uh, the, the government, because the, the people who control like the CPI and the PCE measure, it's just a team of nerdy economists sitting in Washington, D.C. They have no political bias. They're trying to do the best work they can to estimate what is the true cost of living going up for the average American. It's just nerdy economists doing it. It's not politicians getting involved. Can you join me in thanking Rick? Right. Thank you just what you needed. I want to wish you all a very happy new year, happy holidays. We'll see Rick back in 2020.